Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Martin Mulholland, Senior Dairying Technologist at CAFRI, and I'd like to welcome you to this, the third of three CAFRI CAF 2020 webinars. The subject tonight is hygiene, health, and welfare in rearing dairy bred calves. The new CAFRI calf unit was completed a little over a year ago, and at that stage we had planned an open day here at Greenmount about this time to demonstrate the unit and the management of the calves with the experience of one year's use. Unfortunately, we haven't been able to do that due to COVID-19, so we have prepared these three webinars based on the new CAFRI calf unit with speakers tonight from AFBE and CAFRI's Stephen Gilkinson. We will be recording tonight's event and it will, will be available through our website on CAFRI TV later on. There will be links to the website and to our Facebook page at the end of the event. Tonight's uh, webinar looks at research into hygiene and health in rearing dairy bred calves and how we are implementing this research at CAFRI. I would like to mention one specific project the CAFRI Calf House is involved with, the EU Dairy for Future project. This is a dairy farming sustainability project which aims to increase dairy farm profitability and reduce greenhouse gas emissions from dairy farming. Achieving 24-month calving and improving calf and subsequent cow performance and longevity makes an important contribution towards both profitability improvement and also reducing greenhouse gas emissions. On the screen is a list of our speakers for tonight and the panel to answer questions at the end. The two presentations will last about 45 minutes, and then we will have 15 minutes at the end for questions. In terms of asking questions, you will have the opportunity throughout the event to submit your questions electronically. Laptop users can submit questions using the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. Mobile and tablet users can access the Q&A option via the three-dot icon which appears when you tap your mobile device screen. Please submit your questions using the All Panelists option. We will try to answer as many of these questions as we can after the presentations. So on to our first speaker. I'm very pleased to, this evening to introduce Aaron Brown from Athby Hillsborough. Aaron is a PhD student undertaking calf housing and management research through the AgriSearch and DERA funded OptiHouse project. Aaron spoke at the first of our three CAFRI CAF 2020 webinars on calf housing design problems and fixes on farms participating in the OptiHouse project. This evening, Aaron will present interim findings on hygiene data collected from the OptiHouse farms. Aaron, over to you. Um, certainly. Uh, having good housing is, is key to reducing physiological stress and, uh, and aiding in hygiene. But certainly, if we um, we, have, we, may, we can have good housing, but if the, the management isn't there, we can we can still have problems with hygiene. Um, and so that's what I want to talk about this evening. So good, so good housing won't solve all our problems if the hygiene is poor. So, um, okay. So why you focus on hygiene itself? Well, because we've got we've got a young calf, young calf are very, very uh, susceptible to disease. Uh, certainly in these first 30 days, when our main problem is going to be uh, calf enteritis. Uh, sorry, uh, where our uh, main problem is going to be calf enteritis. Um, uh, hygiene within the calf environment uh, plays a key role within this. So the, the, the level of uh, pathogens that we have coming, uh, the, the calf is placed within, um, is going to uh, cause issues. Um, as, as it enters into the calf's gut or it finds ways there, um, as the calf sort of um, within that environment. Um, this is Sheila McGurk from the University of Wisconsin Madison um, has identified the main sources of, of enteric pathogens. And I'll just um, sort of dwell on those uh, for, a few, for a few minutes. So, for, first of all, the bedding. So, our calves are lying down for the majority of the time or for 70% of the time. Uh, so it's, it's like the main main source of, in, of enteric pathogens, so like your cryptosporidium, um, rotavirus, coronavirus, salmonella, and uh, and E. coli. Um, uh, and, and also added to that, you've also got the feed equipment, so our, our teat feeders, the mixing equipment, all that there, buckets that the, the meal and water has been fed in, and we also want that to be clean. Um, the pen itself, so the surrounds of the pen, so as we have calves um, within pens and, and 
one, a, a group of calves or a single calf continually within pens, they're uh, adding to adding to the to the bacteria levels within that, um, and that's why we need to wash it. And then uh, the feed itself, so the feed's getting direct access to the uh, to the to the, the gastrointestinal tract, and we want that uh, to be as clean as possible, so that it isn't interfering with the, the digestion or, or causing a, a enteritis. Um, the rear, so so you ask yourself uh, the clothes that you're wearing, your gloves, your your boiler suit, or your your wellies. And certainly, we, uh, as you're working with, from with other animals in the farm and, and maybe in some dirty environments, it's, it's important that that our clothes or whatever are cl- clean as we go to work with the calves. Especially if we're working from one pa- uh, pen to another and work with them carrying things uh, through the pens ourselves. And then finally, um, other animals, so that can be uh, so other calves in the calf house, older livestock on the farm. And uh, the likes of pets and pests. So, in terms of the opto house uh, overview, again, we, as I said before, we we, uh, we visited six, six dairy farms in spring 2019 in partnership with the dairy or the Caffrey Dairy Advisory Team to, un- to undertake that survey. Uh, samples were lifted on the farm um, for for the analysis of hygiene and, and uh, what we do, what way did we do that? We um, a uh, culture samples for for total viable counts, so that, that gives you an idea of sort of the general overall hygiene. The number of uh, that includes the uh, uh, bacteria, uh, molds, uh, and yeasts, um, and then total coliform counts, which g- gives you an indication of of soil and fecal contamination, and then E. coli counts, which are sort of an indicator count for uh, for for fecal contamination. And then, as you can see on the right, so the, the different types of samples that we took uh, were were bedding, uh, milk and milk replacer. Uh, water, uh, feeding equipment, swabs of feeding equipment, and, and starter feed, so uh, meal from that was in front of the calves. Uh, so looking first of all, the, the sort of within that feed bracket, and as I say, feed uh, it has direct access to the gastrointestinal tract, and, and we we don't want it to be as clean as possible. So not we're not reducing um, the uh, digestion efficiency. So at this stage in life, we want our calf to be getting as much uh, out of the feed that we we uh, we give it. Um, uh, putting that to growth, and, and certainly as as we're paying for things in multiple places that are more typically more expensive, we want to get as much from it as possible, um, and we also don't want a uh, sort of a pathogenic effect uh, and, and enteritis being caused. <clears throat> so first of all, in terms of uh, feed, the, the water hygiene. So water samples were taken, and this these this data uh, first data uh, incorporates data from sixty all sixty six farms. Um, uh, the first column that I have sort of an idea as a, as a main average sort of of the different types of counts. So a TVC at 22 degrees basically uh, is an indication of the number of, <coughs> of uh, the number of bacteria <coughs> that are uh, prevalent at room temperature. TVC at 37 degrees is, is those bacteria that are going to be uh, pre- are prevalent or, or uh, working at uh, body temperature. And then coliforms again. Um, uh, a an indicator of soil and fecal contamination and E. coli indicator of, of uh, fecal contamination. And the mains there you can see, so we're looking there at 22 degrees, uh, uh, 1.8 million, um, and and then working all the way down there to to an average of a uh, six uh, six thousand CFU per mil for the um, the E. coli. And uh, as, as such at the minute, there's no real standards in terms of what you should you be looking for or expecting or what you should aim for. Uh, within the dairy calf industry, so we, we sort of looked then at the at the, the red tractor pig pig standards, um, as pigs also are being monogastrics and that tip, uh, also trying to maintain level, good levels of hygiene. Um, within the standards for for those uh, different counts within those um, within the red tractor pig standards, you are looking for less than a thousand CFU per mil. Uh, of TVCs, less than uh, 100 coliforms uh, CFU per mil and, and basically zero uh, E. coli uh, per mil. And that's what we'd like to see. In terms of E. coli, we'd like to see no E. coli across the board, regardless of whether that's water or milk or, or starter or whatever. Uh, we don't want really access to that uh, within our calves' feed. Um, now, what, what, what uh, do the, the samples that we took look like in, uh, in relation to that? Um, so 3% of the samples um, of of the samples were within the associated uh, TVC at uh, 22 degrees standard, so that means that 97% of that were are well, well, well over that 1,000 CFU per mil, so quite generally quite dirty. Um, and, and you can see there in terms of TVC at 37 and, and, and coliforms there, 15 and 22%. Then looking at E. coli, only 11% of the samples were within that, uh, or 11% of the samples had no uh, E. coli uh, in them. Which obviously the majority of samples then do, and again that's a that's a major risk in terms of uh, in terms of 
uh, enteritis and the like to calves, particularly when you think the likes of uh, cryptosporidium there that has a survivability in water uh, of uh, about six months um, at room temperature. And so we're trying to, we want uh, that water to be as clean as possible, so we're not risking the calf. Additional to that, uh, if, you're, if your water's dirtier, it's really you've reduced pa- uh, palatability and, and your voluntary uh, intakes of water are going to be reduced, and that sort of will also have impacts on your starter intake as you're taking the calf onto weaning. Um, so the samples then were uh, the, the results of this were looked at then along with some of the sort of the the aspects of the drinkers themselves and the, where, where the water was coming from. Um, in the particular in this first case, uh, we looked at where sort of the source of the water was. The water coming from mains or coming from a bore well. Um, and as you can see there across the counts, uh, looking at the green columns uh, for bore well and the red columns for for the mains, the counts for bore well were, were significantly higher. Uh, on all, in all cases, um, uh, whether that be TVCs, whether that be E. coli. And so certainly if, I, if, 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 if uh, the water is being sourced from a bore well, I would be thinking maybe about testing that and getting, ensuring that uh, the, the levels aren't uh, very high and that isn't going to be uh, a potential sort of a, a way in for, for more bacteria into the system in a, in a house when you're trying to keep everything else clean. And certainly uh, making sure that water is clean and, and I know there can be tendency sometimes to leave water in front of cows, especially in the first few weeks when they're, they're drinking less. And indeed, nearly 70% of the farms were, uh, were offering water from birth. Um, and calves don't drink a wild pile, so we don't want to, we don't want to leave a lot of water that's going to be sitting there for days and days and days. We, we'd rather be replacing that or, or, give, or at least giving them less and replacing that uh, so that that's not uh, building up in terms of bacteria. Uh, also, the, in terms of the location of the pen, uh, there was a significant association between the location of the drinker uh, in relation to the pen, so wh- whether that drinker was outside or inside the pen, and particularly in the likes of this case, in, the case, in this case, it would be where your your uh, your individual calf pen has your uh, concentrate and the water buckets outside the front, and that is um, <clears throat> a sort of the typical of of what we're seeing here, um, but. In terms of TVC at 22 degrees and uh, coliforms, the 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 where the water was sourced outside the pen and these and the likes of these buckets, it was significantly higher than than where in cases where the the drinker was inside the pen. I suppose likely uh, the 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 reason behind that could be potentially I suppose that you have your your starter and your water right beside each other. The calf's nosing his head in and out of one one to the other, and there's a lot of cross contamination between the two. And and also maybe the fact that your your calf's sucking from a tape above that, and you've slide and things like that going into that uh, water as well. So again, it's it's important to just ensure that water's clean. And um, there was no realistic significant association between uh, the hygiene levels and the type of the drinker, whether that be a uh, bucketed water that's uh, constantly replaced manually or an ad lib drinker. Uh, or, or where, or the type of the pen that it came from, where so whether that was a, a group pen or a single pen, all the were trends uh, similar to the to the graph shown. Um, so in terms of of milk and milk replacer hygiene, again your milk, your main source of energy and uh, nutrients to the to the calf, and we want to maximise on that and get uh, and get get our calf a good start. We don't want it to be dirty, so that the, whenever the calf, uh, when it, whenever it's getting to the intestines or the or the gut, um. That it's that it's uh, cause that you have bacteria interfering with that, and uh, as well as as well as that uh, colostrum early on, we want that as clean as well. Um, uh, Sheila McGurk from the University of Madison, uh, Wisconsin Madison, has, has again set targets for the likes of uh, TVCs. So in t- in terms of uh, t- TVCs, uh, we would we would like less than ten thousand CFU per mil. Um, uh, 32, uh, uh, 33% percent sorry of the of the samples fell within that target, which uh, certainly is a is a, is a positive. But then you've got the the other samples that are, are much higher than that, um, and you'll see there across the board uh, that sort of the averages. Um, and just remember that at times by a thousand CFU per mil. So we've got some very high counts coming from from the the guys that have are feeding from the bulk tank or uh, or whole milk. Um, and even in the likes of of milk replacer there, which is coming directly from the bag and prepared for our sample, um, we put we put those counts as well. E. coli again, we don't want any. Uh, we don't want, we won't really know trace of E. coli, but you'll see it on the on the very right hand uh, column there are traces of that within uh, the various places that uh, the, the samples are being taken from, and particularly there if if it is a fresh prepared milk replacer, uh, ideally you'll have uh, quality standards and, and whatnot. So. 
you've got uh, you be careful just with where you're storing the micro place or when the bags are open as the bag could have been a covered uh, a covered bin or something uh, to keep sort of bacteria from going into that and the, the mixing equipment what you're mixing that with ensuring that's clean as well so when at the time it's getting to the calf you haven't already compromised the 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 hygiene of it um, and and ensuring that's clean as, as clean as possible um There we go. Uh, so in terms of uh, calf starter hygiene, um, so typically sitting in front of the calf for a while, certainly at the start when they're eating less. Um, you know, the, again, this the, these this data here is from from twenty farms as as is the, the milk data and that uh, analysis is ongoing and it was uh, it was held up a bit by COVID, but we'll we sort of we we'll recommend that. Um, you know, seeing there in the, in the uh, in, the, in the table, not much of a difference between the likes of, of brief pens and single pens, and certainly with no E. coli or anything. Um, whenever when that one particular sample that was taken from storage, um, and we'll move on just to to feed equipment. Uh, so again, uh, we want our feed clean. We're we're getting our feed uh, to the feeding equipment. Is it clean? And then we get it to the feeding equipment. So this is a, a sort of a major thing in terms of uh, keeping it clean. Are, are we washing our feed equipment after on a daily basis, on a monthly basis? Um, so across the across the board, uh, across the 66 farms, there's quite obviously quite a variety of, of how often the milk equipment is being cleaned. Um, over about 37 or 8 percent that are cleaning after every feed and, and ensuring low levels of, of bacteria able to build up. Um, whereas on the other side of the spectrum, you've got 20 percent of the farms that are cleaning feed equipment monthly, and certainly you're going to ex- you can expect a, a fair build up. Over that time, um, and and it'll be harder to clean also. Uh, in terms of how the how that that uh, the milk feeding equipment is being cleaned, um, again a variety. Some uh, over twenty five percent or about twenty eight percent cleaning with hot water and a chemical, um, and there's no real trend between the um, how often and. The, the way that it's being done. So there is there is there are farms that are that are only washing them uh, every few weeks or every month and doing that with cold water. And realistically speaking, that's not going to clean uh, going to clean their feed equipment and and get it as close to sterile as possible for these young calves. The key thing to remember is these calves are, are literally neonatals; they're they're babies, and and uh, these this the feed equipment needs to be as close as possible to sterile uh, to, to re- reduce uh, or minimise the risk. Uh, of of bacteria and, and other and viruses and the like getting in, um, and then again also you've got the the, the one or one farm there that's not cleaning feeding equipment at all. Yeah, so what that's sort of what you're seeing across the board, um, and certainly I would I would prefer to have my feeding equipment for calves looking like uh, the the first or, or third picture across there. Um, clean and, and as close as possible to sterile, not causing a high risk, um, and not having a, a, a sort of a build up of fats and the like of that that's going to harbour bacteria and that's going to make it even harder to clean and to ensure that you're getting as clean as possible for those calves. Um, and certainly, we will uh, try if you're if you're feeding your calf, uh, ensuring that feed, uh, cleaning that feeding equipment, you know, to see after that feed, doing you know, every feed or at least daily uh, to keep that uh, the, those levels low. And there's one particularly um, dirty instance of a feeder, and as someone said to me, I don't know what scares me most, the 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 hygiene of the feeder or the hygiene of the bed, but certainly that there's going to present a major risk uh, to those calves, and, and it's going to be particularly hard to clean also. So then looking at the feeding equipment, so what was the, in terms of the counts, and there's obviously there's a lot of different types of feeders being used, and some we only had, we're only give, able to get a couple of observations of, and some there's a lot more. Um, and again, this data is from 20 of the farms, uh, as, as data is, our analysis is ongoing. Um, it's certainly a, quite a variety, and uh, what I suppose is quite encouraging is the, is the low levels of, of, of E. coli being seen, and, and particularly a lot of those we're seeing none at all. Um, and it'll be certainly interesting to see the rest of the farms as well. We continue to analyze that uh, and analyze those samples. Um, uh, yeah, and uh, opposed to the one, uh, the one particularly dirty single pen feeder that brought the the main E. coli up for, uh, uh, for, for that. So, 
And then looking at the, 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 the tapes for feeders, um, the, the TVCs there on a single single pen, actually a lot higher than the likes of, uh, of the, group, the group pen feeder tapes and the automatic feeder tapes. And certainly there will be some sort of uh, explanation for that within sort of the, um, how often those are being cleaned and I suppose with, um, in, terms, uh, in terms of how well they're being cleaned also. Uh, so uh, when we're thinking of, of cleaning um, feeding equipment, obviously we want to get that away. When we're doing that, not only washing it away from the from the calves from the point of view that we're not reducing the humidity uh, around the calf rearing area, but also that we're ensuring that when we're uh, that we're getting a nice clean area to wash that and get and get all the liquid away. Um, so 35% of the farms had a, a designated cleaning area. Um, 23% had a, a designated drying area, a designated drying area that wasn't on the floor, and these are some. A lot of these are, are pictures from the intervention study where we made changes in that. But um, certainly good, uh, sort of very practical tips in terms of trying to get uh, feeders dried off the floor where you have a lot of bacteria walking over it, animals are walking over it, um, and maybe you've got uh, poor drainage issues. Getting feeders washed and up out of the way um, to allow them to dry. Which particularly will make it harder for bacteria to continue to, to thrive on that, but also um, ready to go again for you whenever you're feeding the calves later. Uh, then looking at the the, the bedding, so um, again, as I say, the most likely source of of uh, of enteritis contamination or uh, of uh, pathogens, like your scour pathogens, and um, as the calf spends the majority of its time lying down, and certainly. Uh, if the use of fresh bedding is important in this, and, and the, the likes of getting things like drainage right, that your your bedding's dry and, it's, and you're continuing to put down fresh bedding, will be a, a major part of any successful calf rear uh, uh, enterprise. Um, so in terms of the, the frequency of, of cleaning these calf pens across the board, and this is including both uh, single and group pens, um, for simplicity's sake, uh, so across the, across the board, in the percentage of pens, the majority of uh, of these pens are being cleaned every four to six weeks, which I suppose is a sort of an, a, a mid between practicality and get to maintain hygiene. Whereas on the other side, you're going to have uh, as you go down there, keep one right where your where your um your pens are only being cleaned cleaned out once or twice per year, and in particular for your when you're your individual pens, where uh, you have young calves, the age of a of a, a day or two, um going in. It's, we, need, we need to make sure that's a clean environment for them to go into. Um, and particularly if you're if you're changing calves, uh, getting that pen clean between between calves is, is certainly important. Not only how often we're cleaning it, but also how we're cleaning it. So here, obviously, you can see there's a variety in terms of the way we, we clean things and maybe how we how clean we think things should be. Um, so 25% roughly of the farms are only cleaning out the pens uh, manually, so that's basically scraping out all the straw and then just uh, preparing more uh, straw where that is. Um, then looking at the, uh, the another 25% of the farms where they're cleaning them out and then disinfecting. And the only the issue I suppose would to be sort of thinking about here would be that that is your, if you're cleaning out pens but not removing the organic matter by the use of a power, of a power hose or whatever, you can't necessarily you can't uh, disinfect uh, organic matter. And so you're you're you may essentially be wasting disinfectants and putting it on something that isn't necessarily going to uh, reduce or or uh, minimise the the level of pathogens in that area. So it's certainly important to to get that completely cleaned. Um, and I know there is practical issues if you're if you're uh, have calves running in and out um, of of a house continually and, and getting a space to get uh, a space of time to get that cleaned out. But certainly. Um, it's important to find periods throughout the year where you can do that to get that house cleaned and, and the, uh, the bacteria levels reset. Um, so then in terms of what the counts were, and again this is only from 20 farms, uh, so uh, Sheila McGurk would place the target for an occupied pen uh, in terms of TVCs less than 2 million CFU per mil and uh, in terms of coliforms less than 500,000 uh, CFU per mil. And then in terms of what you're looking for for a clean pen, so when you've you've actually gone in and you've done all that, you've done that cleaning, less than 5,000 CFU per mil and less than 1,000 CFU per mil. And again, no E. coli, uh, as uh, as little as possible. Um, uh, so so in terms of the counts themselves, um, looking there at uh, at the, what the counts, the counts uh, for, for TVC, um, we're we're a bit higher in terms of the average over that uh, those targets as well, and also in 
the in both the group and the single pens, um, and then also within the um, the color forms, and again uh, a high level of um, of E. coli within this, the occupied single pens. Um, so, what, 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 how does this manifest itself at um, at sort of calf level and uh, sort of the issues with calf mortality and scour cases? Um, uh, one, I've got two examples here. So, one example of a farm here where they're um, starting to calve in August, they have no real issues, um, have no issues at the start, and as they get into calving and it gets a bit busier, then they start to see a lot of issues with scour and a lot of uh, calf mortality there, particularly in the second half of the year. Um, this farm in particular is, is cleaning out, uh, it was cleaning the pens out uh, between the calves, but just manually cleaning them out with no washing and no disinfecting. So if you've got your calves or dung in the pen and contaminating that pen, you're not cleaning that out properly to the next calf. And as you keep putting calves in that and taking them out and putting another calf in, you're going to see more issues as that keeps going um, as you have a build up of, of pathogens. And as, as well as that, the feeding buckets. Uh, are being cleaned out uh, just between calves, so it's, it's important that those uh, feeding buckets are cleaned on a regular basis to, to sort of get that as close as possible to sterile. And the other example of a farm here where you're more closer to all year round calving, um, and they're not necessarily having problems with calf mortality, and I suppose that's, that could be down to how the management of, of spire calves and how they're dealing with them, particularly a lot of cases throughout the year uh, of, of spire. Um, and as it's close to, they may only have one chance here in the middle of the summer to get cleaned out. Um, but but as they're not, uh, as they're only cleaning calves out uh, or pens out between calves without the use of of, of uh, a power wash or power washer or disinfectant, and they're only uh, feeding, they're only um, cleaning their their buckets monthly with cold water. It is uh, the level of of, of uh, pathogens is going to build up and it's going to continue to be at high levels, so that you're having issues with with scar as as can be seen here. Um, so in terms, so in summary, um, uh, we can see across the board hygiene levels are fairly uh, poor. They're, in terms of the bacteria levels, are quite high, and there is a high risk of of pathogen survival within these uh, particular systems and of calf disease and mortality. Um, so. In terms of what we should be targeting, um, certainly pens should be sufficiently cleaned between calves or groups of calves. Um, it can be impractical, at, I know, at times to, to take calves out um, while they're in and putting them back in. And I know there's there's different uh, there's different um, uh, restrictions on each farm, um, but certainly between groups of calves or between calves. And I know that's particularly one of the advantages of the likes of hutches or your individual pens. You can take those pens out and wash them and power and uh, and let them dry and get them back in again, clean for the next calf. Um, feeding equipment certainly uh, sufficiently cleaned on a daily basis to get that, keep that as close uh, as possible to sterile, ensuring low levels. Um, and but uh, but very importantly, using the use of fresh bedding. And I know we can the bedding certainly at the minute the price is struggling up. Um, but as far as I see, it, as the way I look at it, is that it's not as expensive as the problem of of scour and calves. And certainly, if if your calf's getting scour in the first month of life, you're restricting its uh, its ability to develop its organs and get itself going for whenever you're calving it down in two years in two years time. And um, so, think of it as you're building your cow at this stage. We want to give it the best start. We don't want to we don't want to limit it by um, reduced feed efficiency or or disease. And then. So what is sufficient, sufficient cleaning? Well, first of all, removing the organic matter. So whether that be um, be your pen or your feeding equipment, making sure that it is cleaned out of of anything that can uh, hold um, can hold bacteria behind it. It's uh, clean maybe in the case of feeding equipment, the use of like a fairy liquid and the likes to remove those fats and um, and, and things that will sort of hold uh, or biofilms that will hold bacteria within them. Um, applying the the, the correct disinfectant at the correct rate for the correct time, so you can follow the what what's what the product the product uh, is saying, and then ensuring that those surfaces to dry. And for me, drying surf drying surfaces, whether that be your feeding equipment or your calf pens, before animals are going in, moisture, I suppose, is is sort of a, a, the enemy of successful uh, of successful calf rearing, um, and we want everything to be as as dry as possible, and certainly. Um, Allowing that feeding equipment to dry before feeding it is sort of reducing the, the, the ability of pathogens um, to to thrive. Um, I'll just hand back to to Martin now. Thank you, Martin. Thank you for uh, an excellent presentation. 
It uh, was very interesting to see the, the novel uh, data you're generating from the OptiHouse project on, on the hygiene and health. It's certainly something I've, I've never really come across any data on, on before. And I'm sure the, the data that you've presented will generate lots of questions from our, our viewers. Uh, as I said earlier, viewers can ask questions at any time. Please submit your questions using the, the all panelists options uh, when you are uh, typing in your questions. Now turning to our next speaker, uh, that is Stephen Gilkinson from CAFRI. Stephen joined CAFRI in 2013 and is involved in investigating dairy herd health and hygiene related technologies uh, at uh, Greenmount Campus CAFRI. Stephen has uh, pre-recorded his presentation for this evening. And as we play his presentation, please note that if you wish to enlarge the video display, uh, you can do so by clicking the expand view or full screen icons found at the bottom right of the video. Uh, last week, we had a, a very small number of attendees report that they couldn't view the video but could hear audio. If this is the case for you, try logging out and logging in again to the event to rectify the issue. If you find your connection is not sufficient to support the video playback, you will be able to view the, the webinar recording at a later stage when we put it up on the, the CAFRI TV channel. Stephen, we look forward to your presentation. Good evening, everyone. My name is Stephen Gilkinson. I'm part of the Dairy and Technology team at Greenmount Campus. I previously worked in AFP Hillsborough in the Dairy and Research and also in Nutrient Management and Anaerobic Digestion before moving to Greenmount about seven years ago. So what are we going to cover in this presentation? We're going to look at colostrum hygiene, a wee bit on Yoni's disease and calves. Think about the holistic calf rearing triangle. A wee bit on replacement heifer deaths in Northern Ireland, and just a summary to conclude. Colostrum hygiene. What do we mean by colostrum hygiene? You will be familiar with the three Qs already. Quantity, quickly, and quality. And I want to add in another one there, H for hygiene. So we've got the three Qs plus H or QUISH for short. So there's an acronym for you to remember. So how can this bacterial contamination be minimized in the colostrum? And a very important question, are there benefits, positive benefits of good colostrum hygiene? And also, what about pasteurization? Colostrum hygiene, how would you treat Newborn babies feeding utensils. Would you just give them a bit of a quick wash out in cold water? Of course not. You'd use warm soapy water and then put them in the sterilizer. Really should we treat the feeding equipment for newborn calves any different? Because contamination with bacteria can happen from the udder to the calf through every process in between whether that the, cow, the cow's hand milked or through a mobile milker, the bucket, the stomach tube, or whatever else. Results from an AFP survey in all the iron dairy farms have shown that 81% of colostrum samples exceeded recommended bacterial levels. Some are worked down south, bacterial levels. Colostrum stored up to six hours post melting and ambient temperature showed a rapid increase in spotage. Basically, the higher the storage temperature, the higher the bacterial growth. And some are finding from research right across the world. Colostrum hygiene, what should you do? I think it's important to ask ourselves the question, why is the colostrum being stored? Is it just convenience for the next cow being born? And if it is being stored, what hygiene measures are being applied? Is it just left sitting about? in an uncovered bucket at ambient temperature. Ideally, colostrum should be collected and fed immediately using the sterile equipment. If we're going to store it, refrigerate immediately 
I knew he was within two days. If it's going to be any longer than that, freeze immediately. Alternatively, you might consider pasteurization to reduce the bacterial load, or using potassium sorbate preservative as an additive before storing. So why the fuss about colostrum hygiene? In simple terms, a high bacterial load interferes with the absorption of the colostrum immunoglobulins, or IgGs, which is the passive transfer immunity across the gut wall and into the cow. If you look at this table, we've two levels of bacteria, high and low, in the colostrum. And then looking at the calf serum, or calf blood, IgG levels, post-feeding. And you can see that in the low bacterial levels, colostrum, there's basically double the circulating levels of IgG in the calf relative to the high. And with the apparent efficiency of absorption of colostrum, or AEA, much higher levels in the low bacterial colostrum. However, in this research work, even the high level of bacterial colostrum give adequate passive transfer of immunity, because that level should be 10 or greater. But on farm, on your farm, that may not always be the case. So thinking then of pasteurization. Basically what pasteurization is about is really just reducing the bacterial load that is in that milk colostrum, whatever. It is not sterilization. It just reduces it for a certain amount of time. It will eventually go off. The temperature of the process is very important, particularly for colostrum. Basically it should be 60 degrees for one hour max at no higher temperature. Otherwise, you can get denaturing of those immunoglobulins and you get coagulation to some extent of the colostrum. We find that pasteurization does generally improve the efficiency of antibody absorption across that gut wall and into the calf. But really that very much depends on the level of contamination, bacterial contamination, whatever, and the quality of the colostrum. If you've got lower quality colostrum and high level of contamination, you're not going to get adequate transfer of immunity into the calf. As an aid, it's a tool that can be used. So we can ask the question, is pasteurization necessary? I would argue no. If you're collecting that colostrum fresh from the cow and feeding it fresh to the newborn calf, well then, there should be minimized, you should already have minimized the amount of bacterial contamination that there is. And you're getting that the QQs, the three Qs have been followed, the hygiene has been followed, so therefore it shouldn't be necessary. So the, again, we can ask the question, what do we want to achieve with pasteurization? Is it basically because our hygiene measures are not good enough that we want to, um, you know, get better hygiene basically with the roof a lot of these bugs through pasteurization? Or what, you know, is it for milk that's been fed to, whole milk been fed to calves, you know, with potentially contaminated with ulis, whatever, you know. Uh, so that question needs to be asked individually at farm level. Ulis disease and calves. Calving is a potential high risk time for the spread of ulis disease from the dam to the calf. Therefore, the objective should be to reduce the likelihood of ingestion of con Yoni's contaminated colostrum milk and feces by the newborn calf. So it's important to have herd testing to see what level of prevalence there is in a herd. Calf herd has been annually tested for a number of years. Cows that have been or are possibly positive, have a rear tag inserted in their ear. They are not put in calves to breed replacements, but put to the beef bull. 
When they calved, they would be calved in a separate calving pen from the other cows. The calf will be removed from the dam immediately, not fed its own raw's milk, but fed from a cow that is known Yoni's negative. Cows that have been deemed to be positive for Yoni's disease through the testing regime and backed up by faecal testing will be removed and have been removed from the herd as soon as possible. So the calving area is a very important area. So it should be as clean as possible, as much straw as possible, cleaned out between calvings to minimize that potential of the calf picking up Yoni's disease from its own dam or from other dams. Because we have the potential for the one to many scenario. The one dam can infect many calves in colostrum or through the feeding of whole milk to calves. And certainly whole milk should not be fed to replacement heifers. It is important to use veterinary expertise because this is a difficult disease to get on top of. Information is available on the Animal Health Northern Ireland website. Thinking then of the proverbial three-legged stool for the four-legged animal. And really what we're thinking here about the holistic calf rearing triangle. Basically a stool to stand upright needs three legs. If it's only got two, it's going to fall over. So the three sides, if you like. The holistic calf rearing triangle. We want these heifers to grow into mature, high producing cows, calving down at two years old, and stay in the herd for four plus lactations, and for the calf rearing herd, produce 40,000 litres plus in their lifetime. So each side of the triangle has a knock-on effect on the other sides, positive or negative. We have already looked at colostrum and milk replacer and nutrition of the calf. Very important. We will talk about to mention a bit on disease prevention because prevention is always better than cure. And a bit more on the environment. Yes, it has already been mentioned, but it's worth talking about again because all these things, the more you can get right, the better the chance of having that long lifetime performance. Disease prevention. This is the ha calf health protocol for the calf-free calves. It's a busy slide, so we'll just highlight a few things. Prevention of disease is always better than cure. Calves must get colostrum if they're going to benefit from any protective effect of the rotifac. Plus it's important to have good hygiene of your feeding utensils as well. As far as pneumonia is concerned, this is a big problem or potentially a big problem in calves. Therefore it is important that they are protected. Herd health plans which should include the calves, should be completed and, and reviewed in conjunction with your farm vet. It should be a live document, not just for inspections, red tractor, etc. Second of the calf environment, particularly temperature, bedding, humidity and ventilation. Temperature has already been mentioned. As we know, young calves, temperature is not well regulated, particularly during those first few weeks of life. And hence, during the long winter months, they're going to feel cold and they're going to have to use energy to keep warm rather than growth. So we do want as much energy as possible going to growth. Therefore, yes, a calf jacket, I would say, is a must during the winter. However, jackets may mask signs of pneumonia. So it is preferable to remove them after three or four weeks of age. The bedding. Straw should be dry and deep, allowing the calf to snuggle down and get insulated 
in that straw. This is particularly important for calves in individual calf pens. As far as humidity is concerned, moisture from poorly drained floors, wet concrete, urine bottles, feces will evaporate at hold and hold pathogenic organisms in the airspace. Therefore, this humidity needs to be removed from the house. And that's where ventilation comes in. The removal of that moisture that may contain potentially harmful organisms in the airspace. However, we also know that wind speeds of 0.3 meters per second and above will be felt as a draft at calf level. And that's 0.45 miles per hour, which is not very fast. Aaron Brown has already touched on some of this stuff and possible fixes. The calves in the green mount system are free to move between the igloo and the open straw bed area so they can get out of a draft or into a draft as they want. So then thinking about morbidity and mortality or sickness and death. No doubt you're well aware, you know, it's scars and young calves are the major issue. That's up to sort of two or three weeks old. And pneumonia can be a perennial problem, basically right from almost from birth, but generally in older calves, but not exclusively so. So it is important that we measure to manage, measure treatments that are given to calves. How many calves die? What was the cause of death? So we can effectively benchmark ourselves against yourselves and potentially against other hearts. How are we doing? You know, where can we improve? Where is the the weak leg of that stool, that half a rearing triangle? And we can ask ourselves in terms of mortality, is it a proxy for ill health? You decide. So looking at mortality, this is APHIS data from 2017 calendar year. Dairy herds in Northern Ireland with 20 plus calvings. We had an average of 107 births. And of the replacements, 34.5 were female and 29.1 were male. Give us a total of 53.4% of the cows were bred for replacements. Then looking at the deaths, female deaths up to one month old as a percentage of the female births, 4.3% of those female replacements died within a month. Of the male calves born, 5.7% died, which is quite a big lift compared to the 4.3. So why so much difference between these two? Probably because the male bull calves are not getting the same attention as the female replacements. Probably not getting the colostrum into them, left to their own devices. And there's coming through on the mortality levels. If you look then at replacement heifer deaths, that's 2007 again by age. One month, three months, six months, one year. Two years. So we 4.3 percent dead within a month. 7.2 percent dead in three by three months. 9.3 at six months. 11.1 at a year. 13.1 by two years. But the big thing is here: there is so much variation between farms. Some are very low, some are very high. So we can ask ourselves: how many of your heifers survive? to first lactation, and hopefully calving by two years old. So benchmarking within and between herds for cow and calf mortality could and should be done. So when we look at the risk 
of dying per day of life, as you can see within that first month by day 30. It's over 0.14% per animal per day, which obviously decreases greatly down to when the calf are two years old. So if we can improve this risk time in the first two months of life, we can get a lot more of these calves through to be productive animals coming into the herd. So getting it right in those first two months, yes, will pay huge dividends. So just in summary, colostrum hygiene is important. Keep it clean. That is the colostrum. Keep it clean and keep it cool. Calving is a pinch point for yoni disease, so minimize the risk, particularly at that time. The holistic approach to calf rearing will pay dividends. Get as many as possible of the little things right, and they will add up to the big things, that holistic calf rearing triangle. Measure to manage. If we, if we don't measure, we can't manage, basically, whether that be more morbidity, mortality, whatever it might be. And don't forget to make use of veterinary expertise. expertise. Thank you for another excellent presentation. We'll now move on to the panel session for some questions. Thank you to those viewers that have already sent questions in. If you have any more questions for Aaron or Stephen or the other members of the panel, please send them in fairly shortly as we will try to finish the webinar at 9 p.m. if we can. I would like to, to start the panel session by welcoming the other members of our panel. Firstly, Dr. Cahar McCauley, a director from Fairmount Veterinary Clinic here in Antrim, which provides veterinary services to the Caffrey Farms at Greenmount, and Michael Graham, the farms manager from Greenmount Campus Caffrey. Unfortunately, we've been having some IT problems this evening with the result that Cahar will be logged in from my IT colleague Pamela's computer. So don't be confused by the, the mismatch between the, the name and the, the video image. Cahar, if I could uh, turn to you. Thank you for joining the panel and apologies for the IT problems. Uh, Stephen in his presentation has listed Rotavec as one of the routine vaccines we use here at CAFRI. And it was the subject of a question raised at last week's webinar which I held back uh, for this evening. How effective do you find the Rotavac vaccine on local farms that you deal with? Hi, Martin. Hi, Martin. Yeah, um, I find it a uh, very good, a re really good tool to use. Um, in general, they always see a positive response. Um, much better getting in early with the vaccine, of course, rather than waiting until a problem occurs. Um, to expand that a wee bit, um, in general, uh, the vaccines licensed uh, for calves that, that are getting their mother's milk for about the four, first 14 days. So in a lot of the setups we have now, calves just get colostrum and then on the powdered milk. Um, so in those calves which are getting it for 14 days, they're continually getting the mother's antibodies in the milk. And those antibodies kill off the bugs within the lumen of the bile. Um, the difference is then with these ones which are going on the powdered milk and things, uh, you get a, a, a probably a less good response. Um, and the reason is that the, the antibodies have to be absorbed into the calf's gut. And they usually only secrete those back into the gut uh, for about the next five days or so. So they tend to taper off uh, after that. So you'll get a much better response from the calves which are in the mother's milk all the time. Thanks very much indeed, Car. So certainly what we're doing here in terms of trying to feed the transition milk for at least that first five days should, should hopefully help uh, take advantage of the, the Rotovac vaccine. Uh, turning to the second additional member of our panel, Michael. Uh, good evening, Michael. Um, in the, the first presentation, um, Aaron presented some very interesting data on the, the cleanliness on farms of the, the pens, and in particular the, um, the, the fact that the individual pens were dirtier. Uh, could you comment on the, the policy here with Caffrey on cleaning and resting pens between calves, Michael? Martin, th thank you for the question. Um, this is something that the, the staff do pay a lot of attention to. The individual pens, which are used for the first seven days of the calves' life, 
they're cleaned out between each calf, so they're, each time they're used, they're cleaned. Moved out of the building first, um, straw removed and, and washed and let dry and before they returned again. And again, the large group pens where the igloo is, they're cleaned out after each batch. The igloo's removed, all the bedding's removed uh, with the tractor and loader. Uh, and that's including the large square pen to the front of the igloo. The igloo's taken away and again washed outside the building. Those individual pens and the igloos are fairly easy to wash because of a very smooth plastic finish. And the individual pens being on small caster wheels, they get easily removed from the building. So the staff do pay a lot of attention to that. And it does mean that each time an individual pen is used or each time a group is weaned, from the large pen that they're washed, uh, that clean and dry before they're used again. Okay, Michael, thanks very much for that. Turning to Aaron, Aaron, you showed us some very interesting data on the levels of bacterial contamination of all the calf feeds in your presentation. It particularly struck me in terms of the milk uh, data. Why do you think the, the bulk milk uh, being fed was more much more contaminated than the milk replacer on the, the farm than the Opti House project? Yeah, well, I suppose um, milk replacer in itself is coming, for, uh, certainly there will be quality controls and things that are keeping sort of bacteria levels low. Um, it's coming from the sealed bag generally, and it's in general stored in places much cleaner. Um, if you're taking milk from, our, uh, milk from a cow, for example, you've already maybe got levels of bacteria within that. Um, but you've also maybe got things like uh, the fact that it's sitting there for a while and that bacteria is multiplying. Certainly, the likes of TBCs are going to double every you know 15 minutes or whatever um, when left unattended and, and uncovered. Um, and, and certainly, the, as I say, the, the, the milk replacer is coming from a cleaner. So I suppose, yes, uh, potentially that's how long it sits and, and things like that. Okay, thanks very much, Aaron. Stephen, turning to you. Um, how practical is it to pasteurise colostrum before feeding it to, to calves, in your opinion? And what about the other option you mentioned in your, your presentation of preserving colostrum with potassium sorbate? Well, if, if it's during the day, yes, potentially you could pasteurise. What if it's in the middle of the night and uh, you're up calving a cow? You don't want to spend an hour pasteurising the colostrum before you feed it. You want to get it fed back into bed as basically as quick as possible. Uh, so I suppose yes, if you're already milking the cow at that time of the night, or I suppose any time, feed it fresh, job done. Uh, so there's no real need for pasteurisation in that situation. But uh, mention potassium sorbate uh, or sorbate. It is a food additive, uh, uh, and it's very effective at basically preserving be it colostrum milk or whatever. Research indeed has shown you know four days with potassium sorbate. Yes, in a fridge on minimal bacterial spoilage after that time. So it can be used. Uh, as a, it, it comes as a salt. It's made up to sort of like 50% solution and then about 1 ml per 100, 10, 10 ml per litre will preserve for four days, whatever, no problem. Mm -hmm. And uh, as you mentioned, it is a, a food additive um, used in the, the human food chain, so perfectly yeah. safe. It's basically yeah, no, there's no toxic, there's you know, nothing like that associated with it. You know. and it's, not, it's, it's not hard to handle you know, in terms of problems with skin or hygiene or anything else. Like, you know. Mixing it up and using it, yes. Yep. Certainly a, a practical one for, for people to, to consider. Yep. Uh, Turning to some more of the, the questions coming in from the audience here, uh, one I have here is um, what's the best thing to do to, to combat coccidiosis? And maybe if I could put that firstly to yourself, Cahar. Best thing to do is prevention, but uh, I'll maybe pass that part on to Aaron. With regards to treatment, uh, there's a couple of products available, Baycox and Bacoxin. Uh Those are both treatments. So you give them a drench. Um, and as a one-off drench generally. Uh, the coquinate's another chemical which can be put into feeding things uh, to help to help reduce it. Um, but again, you're better going back to basics um, and try and prevent it. So maybe ask Aaron to comment on hygiene and things. Thanks, Cahar. Over to yourself, Aaron. They're calling you Scar. 
Um, it's a hundred percent necessary that to ensure low levels of hygiene, um, particularly with the likes of coccidiosis and crepus um, ensuring low levels of moisture, keeping sta- like uh, keeping away standing water and things like that in your house, um, getting water drained away. Um, whenever you're using, uh, whenever you're cleaning pens, there's particular products that'll, that'll deal with uh, those uh, protozoa. Um, so the likes of uh, canococcus and killococcus and things like that, which have the particular ingredients in them to kill that in the environment, and ensuring that it's, when you're applying that, you've, you've removed all the organic matter, you've uh, de- de- you've washed it out to remove to help remove that, you've given it time to dry. So you're applying the product to a dry um, to a dry surface, and you're giving it the correct contact time which I think in those cases we're out about two hours but whatever it says in the back and um, basically I give out given a time to um to disinfect properly. It reminds me of a, a comment made to me by an ex student uh, from a, a veterinary lecture in days gone by that you you can't disinfect um, excreta. Um, excreta wasn't the term he used but this is a public forum so we'll uh, not go any further but it is a very useful uh, thing to remember. Uh, the next question we have here is um, in relation to pasteurisation and a question uh, to you, Stephen. Um, as far as um, whole milk is concerned, and uh, you know, to some extent uh, the, the question maybe has been partly answered by Arne already, but um, how effective or how um, uh, appropriate would it be to pasteurise whole milk, Stephen? I assume this is for feeding to calves. I... Yes. Well, pasteurization, as we have basically said, it will reduce the bacterial load significantly. There's no question about that. But, you know, if you think of whole milk going to the factory, you know, before you know it's pasteurized, uh, it, it does a job. It can keep it for a week in your fridge or whatever. Uh, so 60 degrees for up to an hour will definitely reduce bacterial load. I suppose the other side of that is potentially if there's maybe yoni's contamination and you want to be feeding whole milk, Yes, there would be a certain, would be very, very useful there. Not to say it will kill every Yoni's bug, but it will certainly reduce that load big time as well. Mm-hmm. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, Aaron, would you like to make any comment on the um, pasteurisation uh, in relation to maybe some of the data you presented on the whole milk? Um, yeah, I suppose. I know I've talked to a couple of guys who have contemplated the uh, contemplated uh, pasteurising milk and I suppose it's the cost of pasteurisation itself is quite high and it puts, can put you off it. Um, I suppose in terms of preventing high high levels of, of um, well and first of all in the case of Yonis I, I think the only the only real thing you can do is, is pasteurise it I suppose or ensure that you're you're not letting Yonis into your replacement or Yonis contaminated milk into your replacement heifers or whatever. Um, but in terms of general hygiene Ensuring that that bacteria levels aren't given the chance to 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 multiply, sort of. So ensuring keeping it refrigerated, um, keeping it covered. I know often a, a lot of time you can have a, a, a dump bucket of milk or whatever sitting in in the parlour and you, you get the lid on it. Like don't uh, allow in a lot of things to be splashing into it and, and increasing further increasing the hygiene levels. And get it fed quick as well as this. And um, don't let it sit about too long. Okay, thanks, Aaron. Uh, Cahar, from your practice work, uh, do you find uh, any farmers pasteurizing whole milk with their feeding to calves? Yeah, we've had a few farmers uh, that have done it from time to time and then haven't stopped. But, uh, there wouldn't be anybody really sticking with it that much. Um, I would also add, if you could, uh, if you are going to do it, probably best pick the cows which have most recently calved to get your antibodies into your milk. Um, and also try and pick the cows which have been tested for yonis and had low readings. And ideally pick cows also if you can, if you have a history of testing for yonis, whose mothers and grandmothers have all been low. Um, and that way you would help really reduce the risk of yonis. Um, pasteurization is a very good technique at reducing it, but this, if you've done that as well, it would be even better again. Yes, to, to think holistically of, of all the challenges uh, we're facing. Okay, the, the next question we have here um, is in relation to mycoplasma, and uh, probably it would be most appropriate to put it to, to you again first, uh, Cahar. Uh, any suggestions on how to deal with mycoplasma in calves? It's a, it's a very, very tough one. Um, feeding the, the whole milk certainly is a big uh, method of transmitting mycoplasma from, from the cow herd to the calf herd. 
um, you're trying to get all in, all out type of stockmanship going on where all the calves aren't being mixed, young calves with old calves and uh, any calves with basically adult cattle. You're trying to you're trying to break that cycle. Um, there's not a big lot available in the way of vaccines. Um, you can get some made specifically for your farm. Um, there was a report recently in the NBA magazine there uh, discussing um, about about a vaccine brought in from America with a very very good result. So it's a space to watch. If we could get a decent vaccine, it would be great. But apart from that, really, it's down to management and keeping animals separate where we can and management managing them in groups and not feeding cow's milk for very long periods of time. Okay, thanks, um, Cahar. Uh, maybe, Aaron, coming back to, to you in relation to you know, some of the, the cleanliness uh, data or the contamination data you presented, the, you, sh you showed that the, the data from the uh, Opti House farms, that the single pens were much dirtier from uh, memory than the, the group pens. Uh, any that you're aware of? Yeah, I suppose it's a matter of um, a sort of the density of uh, of bacteria per area. You've got a your the stocking densities or the space allowances in in uh, single pens are in general lower. Like you're working say a 1.2 to 1.8 meters per squared per animal in a single pen, generally because of the design of them. Um, as opposed to a group pen, which uh, in terms of our results, I think I showed it last uh, two weeks ago. The stocking densities in, in group uh, in group pens are lower. They're just closer to three meters squared, um, or at least over two anyway. And um, I suppose as you have you have smaller areas for animal, they're 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 done at the same rate. They're putting out the same amount in a smaller area. So the, the, in general, the the counts per uh, per area, and in this case, it was a five by five centimeter square where we were swabbing. Um, that's going to be that's going to um, uh, that's going to be increased. Um, I I would say. Um, also, I suppose the point is the fact that a lot of, and, and in the case of study, some of the farmers that are that are keeping cows in single pens are doing so for a, for a short period of time, like what Michael's saying there, but maybe aren't washing those pens or cleaning those pens after because the calves in pursuits are relatively short amount of time. They're sort of letting a few calves go through that can also allow build up and is also a major risk to the second and third and fourth calves going through it. Yes, it um, you know, brings home the uh, the need to thoroughly clean and disinfect those pens between uses uh, as we are doing. And I think uh, in terms of the, the increasing range of uh, individual pens or groups of individual pens available in, in modules on, on the market uh, would present farmers with more opportunities to, to get a break between calves to let them be thoroughly cleaned out and disinfected. Well, maybe uh, another question, Michael, if I could put to yourself. Uh, student training is key to everything we do here at CAFRI. Um, what has been the reaction of uh, the students um, working in the, the new calf house last year in this to the cleaning facilities we've provided in, in the new calf house? Thanks, Martin. Yeah, very, very positive. Um, you know, the calf house, the performance of the calves uh, and everything in it has been excellent. I think that we have designed it in such a way that cleaning is relatively easy. You know, there's water in the right places, there's right storage of bedding, everything that you know, falls in an easy routine. That that encourages people to, to do those things. Whenever it's um, in a good routine and it's easily done and it's convenient, it, it happens easily. And students that part have taken part in all the, the routines we have. And it has been a good learning experience for them. It's a lovely environment to work in that calf house, uh, and they they enjoy that. Uh, um, and hopefully, they, they learn from that as well. Okay, thanks, Michael. I'm conscious of time, folks. It's uh, almost ten past nine, and uh, I think we've gone through uh, all the questions we have uh, from the participants here. So at this stage, I'd like to to thank uh, our two speakers, uh, Aaron Brown and Stephen Gilkinson. Uh, thank uh, also our panelists, Cahar McCauley and Michael Graham, and uh, also very much like to thank the, the CAFRI technical team that have kept the events moving smoothly this evening, despite the IT difficulties we've been having, etc. Finally, thanks to you, the audience, for joining this event and asking so many questions. This has been the, the last in our, our series of three CAF, CAFRI CAF 2020 webinars. As I mentioned earlier, the event has been recorded and will be available on CAFRI TV later. 
it and a range of other CAFRI webinars can be accessed uh, through the CAFRI website. And um, uh, webinar one is already up there, and webinar two and three will be uh, uploaded shortly. Uh, as we end the, uh, the webinar here this evening, we have a short survey that we would ask you to complete to help us improve CAFRI events in the future. So once the event is completed, please do not shut down your device uh, immediately. The survey will appear automatically, and it's just a few quick questions that will help us to improve what we do. So thank you, good night, and I hope you will all join us again in the future as we are planning uh, webinars on energy efficiency improvements in the CAFRI Dairy Unit in January 2021. Thank you and good night.